Mr. P. P. Anegh Nitti, President of Kasikon Bank, and Ms. K. Sara Manchusi, President of the Stock Exchange of Thailand. The moderator for this session is Yasu Ota, columnist of Nikkei Asian Review and editorial writer of Nikkei. Mr. Ota, please begin the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome back to the floor. Uh, welcome to the session of the financial market. We're going to talk about the risk and chance. And uh, the, the major target of the session is to discuss opportunities and uh, hidden risk surrounding the ASEAN financial markets. As, uh, no need to mention the Brexit and uh, the Trump, Trump administration uh, in the U.S. So the, the, the world order is being shaken by uh, many uh, unexpected phenomena. So we have to check if the ASEAN in financially, its stability is okay or not, and with uh, risk and with opportunity. And uh, first of all, I'm honored to introduce the three distinguished members here, to the panelists. But uh, in the preparatory sessions, just coming to this room, I asked three of them to make their, the, the first statement as short as possible. <laughs> because my intention is to conduct this session in a rather uh, unconventional way. We would like to have a sort of talk show so that we can uh, get a the reality there's many stories hidden in their mind. So uh, who should I start with? I think, uh, okay, let me start with, uh, with Mr. Frederick uh, de Buncio. Uh, Mr. de Buncio is a former veteran investment banker. You are the banker. But who joined in NSM investment in 2011 and was appointed president this April this is a historical event. So it was a big news in the Nikkei Asian Review. He appointed as the president of SM because he is the first person to be assigned as a president who comes from the outside of the, the founding family. So this means something. We have to check what this means in terms of the corporate governance later. So why don't you start? The floor is yours, Mr. De Buncio. Yes. <coughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for Nikkei, this kind invitation, and I'm very pleased to participate in this business forum. Undoubtedly, the ASEAN market's integration opens up to endless possibilities for those who wish to take part and be competitive. It allows free flow of goods, services, capital, and investments. There is higher awareness about ASEAN integration today which provides access to economies that have been growing at an average rate of 5.3% in annual GDP growth from 2000 to 2016. Access to corporates and markets with a youthful population of 635 million people. Financial markets in ASEAN will open doors to new pools of investors for debt and equity issuances, especially for Philippine corporates. Competition is part of the game which could provide pressure on margins and profitability, especially with the presence of larger ASEAN corporates getting their feet wet in the Philippine market. More interestingly is that ASEAN integration is also happening at the cusp of a digital revolution. As technology further evolves and connects economies of varied cultures and geopolitics, more issues come to the fore and present complex challenges and disruptive opportunities for everyone. At SM Investments Corporation, we are preparing for multiple scenarios. Basically, at the core of this is making sure our financial position is strong. We are also studying very closely the evolving digital landscape and its possible impact on our businesses and the rest of the region, taking into account our strengths and keeping our ears close to the ground for opportunities. Our company has been in the Philippines for nearly 60 years 
and we are still committed to investing in the country as we see high potential for growth. SM is uniquely positioned to capture the growth in the Philippine economy because of its strong brand franchise, market-leading position, synergies, and track record of success. Our government's plans for investment in infrastructure, agriculture, and tourism in particular give us high confidence in expanding our presence across the country. Outside of our own borders, we are invested in China through our malls. We have seven malls there as we endeavor to provide the same quality and level of service our company and our brand are known for in emerging cities in China with a growing middle class. Asia and ASEAN in particular are large growth regions and therefore ripe for those who would have the mindset and resources to compete. Our goal is to further strengthen our own market position locally in order to better face greater ASEAN interconnectivity. Before I close, let me briefly share what we look for as an investment company when we expand. Before we go into new markets, we ask ourselves how this can potentially enhance group synergies. We look for businesses that can offer stable cash flows and attractive financial returns. Like the proverbial suitor, SM is attracted to companies that can capture high growth opportunities. We like market leaders or those with potential to become leaders in their chosen sectors. It is very timely that through this forum, we seek to understand the numerous opportunities ASEAN integration opens for us. Again, thank you for letting me participate, and I look forward to our ensuing discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dippens here. I understand, I understand you placed uh, several important keywords, such as uh, 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 competition, connectivity, digital, and uh, synergy and China. Let's talk about them later. Okay, next up is Mr. Pepit Arnefti, uh, who was a uh, unique resume. Uh, he's a, a former pharmacist. Why you? Really? So you're a chemist, yeah. not a banker. <laughs> but now turned veteran banker after leading uh, Kashkon Bank's regional expansion as head of the World Business Division. You are the head of the World Division now. And uh, Mr. Pivot was appointed president this January. Uh, currently, he's in the uh, forefront of the bank's fintech uh, research works, and which I look forward to hearing about later. Okay, Mr. Pivot, please enlighten me. Okay, can I just sit here? Sure. Yeah, to call out you know, the topic we are going to discuss about. Um, in the first uh, opening session, the Deputy Prime Minister mentions a lot about you know, the major economic trends in this region. Right. And then it really means, you know, for us, some of the factors are considered the threat and some, you know, are considered opportunities, right? So the um, topic I'm going to call out, you know, as a summary or the sum up of what uh, this session is going to be about is that agents provide a lot of opportunity to grow. This um, market has a big, big potential economically and even politically. And I think that the, uh, the, for the upcoming promising uh, digital innovation, we as bank, we have to rethink and reconsider our new growth strategy. And at the same time, we have to align our resources to build new talent, right, to stay relevant to the consumers, to make sure that we can continue to create value to the clients who started to move across the border because these upcoming opportunities, and someone might say this is upcoming risk and threats as well. So the aim of the bank is to be able to continue to support the growth of the real sector. We basically think that without the economic activities you know, in, the growth, in the real sector, we as bankers, we have nothing to do. This is the role of the bank to support, you know, the economic activities of the real sector. This is the definition, uh, the, the context, you know, that we have to um, hold very strongly. But the change in the um, business landscape, particularly in this region, will continue to change. And this is something very important, you know, for the bank, you know, to come up with a new strategic imperative. 
right, to stay relevant and valuable to consumers. For Gate Bank, I just would like to draw, you know, the uh, strategic imperatives, you know, into two dimensions. The first one is, as a banker, you know, traditional dimension, i.e., we have to deepen consumer understanding to be able to serve them. The market change, right? And the second thing is, we have to think about cross-border solution rather than keep focusing on just on the domestic market as Thai Bank has been performing over the past, say, 50 years. And the third thing is we have to continue to improve service quality, but this time when we talk about the service quality, it means, you know, we have to expand, you know, the, the borders, one again, you know, to go across the border. And the second dimension is related to the um, quite a buzzword, digital transformation or the digitization in the digitalization, right? So I put it very simple here is digital dimension. What we are going to do is we are going to work together with major tech firms, IBM, for example. We can no longer right, work as banker. And we have to look you know, for the business opportunity with fintechs, and also, we have to work together with anyone in the new ecosystem. And of course, the definition of customer will totally change from the traditional definition of customer. The relationship with the bank and the customer will never be the same. The customer can turn competitor tomorrow or tonight. And at the same time, the customer can become potential partner. So the relationship is going to be changing very fast. That means strategic imperative for K-Bank to move into the region and to stay relevant and valuable to our clients. So what we are going to apply the digital technology, you know, to improve our service and to come up with innovation, we have to play towards our strength. We will be bankers, but the banking definition will never be the same. So we have to redefine banking. This is a key message for us. And the second thing is that we have to embed ourselves into the new ecosystem, right? Because we define, we redefine the landscape of the banking, right? We redefine the um, real sector. And the third thing, um, under the uh, digital dimension, we have to transform organization to be more nimble and agile. Otherwise, no one would like to work with us because conventionally, traditionally, banks are very much rich or worse than the other industry, right? So we have to change. And then the, um, for the major trends, I just would like to draw attention in addition to the um, key uh, uh, speech from the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, the roles of China, the role of Japan into this region will be even more intense. And the second thing is growing interconnectivity in ASEAN, and also maybe we can say ASEAN plus three. At Gasigon Bank, we have been pursuing the uh, strategy called ASEAN AEC plus three. This is the uh, new um, market landscape for us. And the third thing is about the industrial upgrade. As the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned in his speech this, uh, in previous session about the Thailand uh, 0 0.4 and also the uh, is an economic corridor, right? That gonna change the landscape of the real sector economic activities in the region, not just only in Thailand. Just to like to draw, you know, the um, conclusion why ASEAN is so important, why ASEAN is going to be uh, one of the uh, bright spot in the world, you know, for the uh, potential economic activity, the size of population, the demographic dividend with the median age in age in ASEAN just only 29. And the GDP size is about 2.6 trillion US dollar, is about four times smaller than China. But this is interesting enough. And then the GDP creep keep growing, you know, based on the forecast by World Bank or MF, around the ASEAN economies will continue to grow at an average rate of 4.9. It's pretty attractive. And then we can the, um, also say the um, potential of the uh, consumer market, right? The consumption keep expanding and growing. 
And another important thing, I think very important, very interesting for the Japanese uh, 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 business here is the manufacturing hub for the region. Right? We mentioned uh, this morning about the uh, regional supply chain is to soon to be formed. Right? This is the, uh, uh, the key statement I just would like to introduce on, on the station. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You have depicted uh, kind of a scary scene for me. It, uh, today's customer will become the future competitor. But uh, you, you, I'm sure that you are the scientist and you are observing the situation quite objectively. That uh, so Anyhow, you have to fit the reality. So the bank has to evolve into the reality in the future. That's quite an encouraging comment. So the last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Kesela Manchusui. Everybody knows about her. Uh, since beginning, I appointed the stock exchange for Thailand, uh, president in uh, 2014. Uh, Ms. Kesara has known uh, visionary leadership. Uh, you became a sort of the, the figures in the media in Asia. And uh, I think you have, heard, you have been interviewed by us in Tokyo a couple of days ago. Yes, Great. So, so please hold your breath. The, the article will come up to NAL soon. Has it been published yet? Is it? Okay. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay, as she did a lot of things. Uh, started for IPOs, uh, standard setting, and uh, speeding up the process to become the digital exchange. And uh, her most recent project is the launch of the new uh, fundraising platform for startups. That is very new. Uh, which uh, surely helps the uh, motivation for young people in Asia. So, so Ms. Kesera, please share your thought with us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have only, and thank you for Nikkei for uh, inviting me uh -huh, to have uh, the chance to speak here. I would have a very short presentation, uh, only three pages. Uh, so firstly, I would, it would be a time for celebrating, is it celebrating or not, uh, 20 years of the crisis uh -huh, uh, starting from Thai, Thailand. So the Thai economy has come a long way since uh, the financial crisis in the year 1997. 19, uh, our economic growth has been robust uh -huh, with, uh, I just compare from uh, the year 1997 to this year. Uh, and uh, you can see that the GDP has been now uh, four times and the GDP per capita three times uh -huh, from their respective value in 1997. And during this, uh, this same time, uh, the costly lesson from over-reliance on the bank loans in the pre-crisis and the severe credit crunch as the crisis uh, heightened. Thailand financial markets are now well balanced. Comprising healthy bonds and equity market, you can see from the middle, the capital market, and you can see the size of Bahadi three. Uh, the bottom would be the banking sector and the middle uh, is uh, the the capital market, the equity market, and the top one, uh, 308 billion US dollar is the bond market. Uh, the, uh, those comprise healthy bonds and the equity market in addition to the banking sector, while the banking system has been very strong with low non-performing loans, or we call the NPLs, is uh, reduced to right now is about 3%. The capital market has grown to become a meaningful source of funding for the businesses that have uh, gained stronger global presence. People often ask me whether the crisis will occur again. My answer is that it is very unlikely indeed. Not only is the Thai economy now strong in terms of the overall macroeconomic stability, it has proven that it's resilient against the shock such as the uh, subprime crisis uh, in the year 2008. And with the capital market gaining its role as an important source of financing, currently with the market capitalization of uh, 443 billion US dollar, it's about uh, 
107 percent, 107 percent of the GDP, compared to only 24 percent in the year 1997. We have been significant developments both on the demands as well as uh, on the supply side. One of the demand sides, you can see that the Thai market has been much better recognized by the international investors. You can see that the Thai market has been the most liquid exchange in the, last, in the past five consecutive years. And on the IPO side, we are the highest uh, value of the IPO for four consecutive years. And in terms of the MSCI, we got 34 Thai listed companies including the MSCI Standard Index. Moreover, the 39% of 192 companies out of 600 plus companies have diversified their revenue sources to foreign investment and operation and pursue the business strategies to strengthen their global presence. And on the supply side, SET has been offered a full range of the asset classes from those in the cash market, from equities to the derivative markets. Our, regulator, our regulatory environment is also conducive to welcome foreign corporate listing. And we, are, we already have uh, three companies in Laos and uh, Vietnam that list on the exchange, and we are expecting uh, another one is coming for the later of this year. And let me also touch on a few uh, specific initiatives on the new service that the uh, Stock Exchange of Thailand will embark on. Uh, only uh, we, this one is uh, what we have been doing. I think you can read it uh -huh. on the list that company we do have. Uh -huh. Uh, we has been uh, recognized and put into the benchmark of MSCI and DJSI. Investor size uh, on the equity market, I believe that uh, we, has, we has been increased both the institutional investor and the retail investors. And this is the last one that uh, I like to say that uh, in, on this Monday, 17th of July, we are going to introduce uh -huh, another platform we call the Fund Connect. It's a mutual fund trading platform. We, we already have 22 asset management firms and uh, over 30 uh, companies on the selling agent who are going to join us. Uh -huh. This one, this platform would help the retail investor to access into the capital market easier than before. And the second one that on this uh, presentation, we call the startup platform, and uh, the name is Alive, L-I-V-E. Uh, this uh, platform plan to start uh, by uh, the uh, later of uh, this year, and uh, this platform will offer two functions. The first function would be the fundraising, and the second function is the trading platform. And this one is offered to only the startup and the SME, the micro SME, the small company. It's not a third platform because of, uh, if you are aware that the Stock Exchange of Thailand has already has two uh, markets. The first market is called uh, Stock Exchange of Thailand, which is a big company. And the second market is a small company market for alternative investment, we call MAI. Those two markets are listed company, but for this live platform, it would be for startup. We not call them the listed. It would be a register because of those company would not be a public company. It's a, a company. It's a limited company, and it's just a kind of startup. They are more risky than the listed company. That's why uh, what we what we do would be the register. Uh, the, the register condition and also that the buyer, the investor would be, would be only the institutional investor and a quali qualified investor. So we are not open for the retail investor because of, uh, this one is uh, just the beginning that uh, we like to test the market. And more importantly that we also use the, we also uh, kind of experiment that uh -huh, we are going to use the blockchain technology for this platform. So this is, this is uh, how we are going to 
uh, make it uh, for the benefit of the people in Thailand because of uh, we have the Thai of the SME over two billion SME in Thailand, and we also have the startup that I believe that right now is over thousand uh, uh, startup in Thailand. This one we hope that we could help them to have uh, accessibility to the capital market, and we also helping our investor to find uh -huh, more option to invest. And we going to have the new technology to offer for this platform. Uh, I think we sh I should finish it, uh -huh, so you could continue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we have to know more about the LIDE later because uh, I am gonna know how I wanna learn how it really functions, uh, how the money comes, and uh, who can buy, who can make an investment to the startups. I mean, for the investors or the, the venture capitalists, it's kind of difficult to reach the real startups which is valuable in the market. So maybe we should discuss later, but can you add? Hello. Yes, uh -huh. for, for this live platform, that, uh -huh, we know that uh, in terms of the startup, uh -huh, the pain st full story of them is uh, tied to find the funding source. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, we have a lot of uh, funders uh, both the kind of high network clients, even the venture capital or the PE, and uh, but they, they and uh, you have to know that for the exchange we are very good at matchmaker, mm -hmm. so that's why that's why what we we are doing what we good at. Uh -huh. So uh -huh, what we do is uh -huh, we create a platform and uh -huh, we make them. Be, and uh, right now we already have about over 600 uh, SME and uh, startup. Uh -huh. That uh, we already because of uh, we already done a lot of things since last year, so we have in hand about 600 plus uh, startups. So we would migrate them into our live platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of the investor, VC can uh, can uh, can can transact in this uh, platform. And but uh, if it's, if they are the retail, they have to be high network clients. So it's not really a market, it's more like a club It's more or like an OTC market. Oh, it's more like an OTC uh -huh. market. But uh, I would like to say that in terms of the exchange, uh, the platform is a tool. But actually, we have been done a lot of things with the startup since last year. We already set up the, our own fund together with the government agencies. Uh -huh. We uh, put uh, our money together with them, and we invest in the startup. And we also have the ha we running the class for the startup because of, I think the startup has to be kind of more professional in doing things. And we also running the class for the professor from the university all over the country to make them know that the startup is happening in Thailand. So they have to be aware of these kind of things. That's very interesting. I think the, Mr. Pippet is familiar with that you are the scientist and you have the technological background. Those geeky people doesn't sometimes know the, the, how financial system works and they have the knowledge and the idea. But, uh, so it's just like a more educational system. Well, anyhow, that leads to the first topic of today of the resilience of the market here. Um, I found uh, since the launch of the, the Nikkei Asia 300 index uh, last December, uh, it has gained 19% in the first seven months and for far outperforming the 12 gain recorded by stocks in the advanced economy. It's, advanced economy is only 12%, but here it's 19%. So it's, um, it's much bigger increase. And SM, SM investment shares rose 28%, and Kashkong gained 17%, which is good. And, uh, but what does this tell us? That's a big question. Because of the unstable market and the political situation in Europe and the US, probably this is simply a blessing in the disguise for our Asian market. Are we really good, as good as uh, the, the figure tells? So I would like to ask Mr. Pippet first, how resilient and how strong are we? Is the, the growth of this uh, stock index, increase of stock index, tells the truth? What is the reality? Can I just you know, uh, try to um, explain to you 
uh, as a reflection of the real economic activities in Thailand, right? And then Kun Krishra, you know, might help cover s on the uh, fund flows from the international market, right? So that we can say, uh, we can see, you know, the comprehensive picture, you know, of those performance. Okay. Um, I would say we will never see, you know, the uh, growth rates of say eight percent as we have seen before 1997, right? And then we have been in twist and turn, you know, because of the um, global uh, shock over the past 10 years, right? Euro debt crisis, you know, the uh, bigger crisis, and so on. But I would say you have seen the uh, performance of the real sector, you know, from the uh, GDP growth rates of Thai economy over the past 10 years, you know, in average of about 3%, percent, right? No matter how Serious, you know, the crisis hit Thai economy, right? So if we compare these post-crisis growth rates, you know, to the other more advanced economy, I would say this is really a good proof that we are quite resilient, right? Because of the uh, strength of the private sector, as mentioned previously by the deputy government. But going forward, this is another challenge, right? It really depends upon the interpretation of the um, changing uh, business environment. Some think that you know they have seen a lot of opportunities in this region from the um, growing economic activities of the neighboring countries, right? Some of them grab already grabs business opportunity over there, right? Because we have seen. The economic growth of our neighboring countries of an average uh, rate of about 70% percent or even 8%, percent: Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Right. So this is another factor that should be taken into consideration. You know, when we look at the resilience of the Thai economy, because we are no longer just only playing in the domestic market, but a lot of opportunities arise. You know. Across the border, this is maybe this is my view, you know, on the resilience, you know, as reflected in terms of GDP growth rate and the performance of the bank, and also the performance of listed company in Thailand. I see. So when it, it comes to the resilience and the resilience and the competitiveness of uh, of a region, uh, we talked about uh, the Thailand, but uh, it's no longer Thailand. It's no longer just Thailand. It's a center of the Greater Mekong Economic Region. Actually, the last week I drove through um, from Bangkok to uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh via Cambodia. It has taken two days, uh, hiring a minivan, and uh, the bumpy road connect in the, in the leading toward the, the Ho Chi Minh. But it is connected, and it is a beautiful bridge in Cambodia. Over the Mekong River, which is called the uh, Tsubasa Bridge, it's founded by Japanese uh, ODA, I guess, and it's connected, and the uh, traffic is heavy, and uh, it's naturally the people come s in to Thailand from Cambodia, and uh, stuffs the money and uh, the raw materials and the vegetables and foods is transported to the Cambodia every day, no check. So that means there must be some uh, financial activity behind uh, the real uh, economy. So if you take a look at this place as a region, probably the religions is higher than before. I want to ask uh, Mr. De Puncio, in your case, uh, as, um, since you have uh, appointed as a president, you have started a lot of new projects uh, outside of the conventional SM group for uh, business, such as uh, real estate, r retails, but you started the business in uh, energy sector and uh, geothermal uh, uh, technologies and uh, business processing outside the office, and uh, yeah, workers dormitories. It's quite new, and also in China. So, how do you see the opportunity in this region, and uh, what is your Uh, intention and your uh, your your thought to start a new thing and to break even the, in the, your core business. Well, I think our ability to grow and get involved in new businesses, to a certain extent, is helped by the resiliency of the market. Right? 
um, maybe like 10 years or so ago, it was very difficult for Philippine corporates to access long-term money other than going overseas and borrowing in U.S. dollars or in yen. Uh, but today, the financial markets, at least locally, domestically in the Philippines, has grown a lot and has changed, right? It has matured, uh, and now it's very easy to access long-term PESO funding as well. So the, the availability of reasonably priced long-term money uh, actually makes it easier for companies like ourselves to expand and grow into new businesses. As you mentioned earlier, right, the, the SM Group, its core businesses really are banking, property, and retail, right? And each of those businesses on their own are of sufficient scale to do operations on their own without the need for much support from the parent. So they're growing on their own, but given their big scale, the, the growth is steady, but not growing as fast as they would have grown if they were a lot smaller, right? But as the Philippine economy continues to grow very healthily at like 6% growth, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And some of these smaller companies look to us, for example, to help them accelerate that growth potential. So it's these opportunities which are shown to us that makes us feel that, yes, given the size and sort of the, the network within the group on its own, we can actually spur further the growth of these smaller companies to take you know, advantage of the Philippine economic growth. Right? And with that growth opportunity plus availability of long-term PESO funding, uh, it makes it more attractive to expand to these new areas, which could be further growth opportunities for the group in general. So that's what we've been doing these past few years. I see. The uh, Philippines is a sort of, a, apart from the, the continental ASEAN, uh, you are not one of the Mekong region. It's sort of an insular, I would say. But how, when it comes to the region, where exactly do you look at with, uh, with an... In, well, in other than our investment in China, which has been there for a long time with historical ties with the family, right. um, the opportunities now which we're looking at is primarily on the ASEAN region, right? Uh, we still believe that the growth is here. Um, there's a lot of similarities in terms of our culture. So it's easier for us to understand doing business here. Um, we do have a lot of sort of relationships with other major ASEAN-based corporates. So this is the region which we would look at to invest in initially. Um, but just like in our investments in the Philippines, which are not related to our core business, we would always be looking to partner with credible companies that we can, you know, work together with to grow that opportunity wherever that country might be. Mm. Mm. You are known as an uh, M&A &A person as a banker uh, with, the, with your career, right? And uh, what is your next step? Can you reveal us your next strategy? If, if I do that, then I wouldn't be a good M&A &A person, right? <laughs> <laughs> But, but we have just made uh, a few new investments in the country. So for now, we're really focused on growing those new businesses and enhancing value, not just for our shareholders, but also for our partners in those specific projects. But you have a plan in your mind. Uh, we do continue to look at opportunities both domestically and overseas. Good. Good enough. Good answer to the journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Kesela, let's talk about a bit about the funding uh, aspect of the, the economy. Uh, we, we talked about the cross-border activity of uh, trade and uh, the people. And uh, how about money? I mean, you said uh, some Lao companies listed in your market. And uh, what about the, the bond issuance? Uh, I understand, uh, let's say, 20 years ago, if uh, some entrepreneur want to start a new business, they have to go to New York or London or Tokyo probably Singapore, but uh, can you describe what's going on now? 
Yes, uh, I have to say that among the GMS countries, uh -huh, Greater Mekong uh, sub-region, Thailand is uh, the most like high up, uh, oldest capital market among uh, our neighboring country. So the, our capital market has been quite mature in terms of, uh, you can see that uh, we have the bonds market, which uh, uh, since uh, 1997, the bond market has been growing and uh, has been uh, deep enough uh -huh, that uh, people can raise the fund. And we also have uh, the equity market that has been uh, in place for 42 years already. And uh, when we compare to our neighboring country, the CLMV country, they are just young and they are kind of uh, very high uh, growing countries uh, with the uh, GDP growth is more than like, on the average size is more than 8%. So they need a lot of funding. Uh -huh. That's why, uh, but uh, in terms of the credit rating, I don't think that they can grow to other regions to raise the fund. Yeah. So in terms of uh, in the Thai market, we are, quite, we are offering them that uh, they can raise fund to the Thai market, and the Thai market has enough liquidity. And uh, in the past, uh, Laos has been issued a bond for several tranches already. And uh, they can issue in both uh, Thai baht and the U.S. currency too. And right now, actually, we talked to the Myanmar that uh, in terms of the exchange, uh, we can support uh, the rating agency uh, to do the rating at the Myanmar and they can raise fund. Uh, they can issue the bonds in Thailand too. But I think uh, we are working on these issues too. And in terms of the, uh, the, the listing on the uh, equity market, we are open to and we are discussing among uh, with the uh, direct regulators that if we could do the co-listing in uh, Laos and in Cambodia, so they can uh, raise a fund from Thailand, but uh, they can do the trade from both uh, countries. So what is the, exactly the advantage for the companies who want to be listed in the uh, stock market to choose Thai uh, stock exchange uh, rather than New York or London. Uh, is it a proximity, physical proximity with uh, this? For the, uh, if they are in a CLMB country, I believe that uh, for the Thai investor, we, we know them better than others. And in the Thai market, we offer a kind of uh, the better valuation. We compare like Laos and Cambodia, the PE is much lower than uh, the Thai market. We are decent uh, uh, price earning ratio, and uh, in terms of uh, the Thai market, uh, investors are kind of, uh, they, they have a lot of liquidity to invest outside. And if uh, they know that uh, the companies in Laos, in Cambodia, so even in Myanmar, we are used to it, and uh, information is very close, and we do have the Thai brokers who open the branch in those countries too. I see. So we shouldn't underestimate the power of Thai bars. I think I understand there are several cases of bond insurance denominated in Thai bars, right? And uh, also the trade transaction is based on the Thai bars between uh, Laos and Cambodia with Vietnam as well. Mm. Well, that about 12% between Thailand and Vietnam is settled in, in Thai baht. But for the um, Cambodia, um, Laos, and Myanmar, of the 100 of the uh, trading volume between uh, Thailand and those countries, um, I would say about 60 something percent is settled in Thai baht. I see. So that might be the reason, you know, why this uh, quite a surprising information is that the uh, Thai baht has already become mm. number 10 of international settlement currency, I mean, of the world. Thai baht's number 10th international currency? Yes. Okay, which means uh, first, of course, the US dollar, second comes uh, Euro dollar, U yes, Euro. And Hong, Kong, Hong Kong, and then the certain uh, uh, European country, and also the, uh, we just follow the Singaporean dollar, basically. Oh, that's interesting. So, well, that's why you open the branches in the, this region. I, I heard uh, you have opened some branches in the local banks in Cambodia and Myanmar and Vietnam. Yes, in addition to the, um, the fact that we see the uh, upcoming business opportunities in the domestic and the local market in Cambodia and the neighboring countries, you know, but we also see a big opportunity for the cross-border, right? When we, when we say about the international trade, 
right? We are export oriented economy, or import oriented economy, whatever. Um, the uh, border trade is very important for those neighboring countries. About 70 or almost 80 percent in some country, all of the uh, international trade volume is done through border trade rather than international trade. I'm saying international trade, you know, USU and LC, for example, letter of credit, you know, through the international bank, right? This is the way you remit the monies, you know, to settle the transaction. But for those countries with Thailand, rather than international trade, we do it through border trade. I see. It's surprising that more than half of the cross-border transaction is yes. based on the Thai bar. Yes, and again, you know, as Kun uh, Kisra just mentioned, a lot of large Thai conglomerates start going out of Thailand. So this is another business opportunity. We know our customer, we understand them so well, right? We, we are really comfortable with the historical performance and relationship so far with our bank. When they just would like to expand their business operation in the neighboring countries, mm. we can provide funding to them as well. Mm. If they look for funding you know, in the new and local market, that's going to be very difficult for them. I see. I, I like to add sure. that amongst the 660 companies in Thailand, 192 companies already have a the offshore business. And among those, had over 100 companies already have a the business among the GMS countries, which is our neighboring countries. And uh, if we talk about the trade, total trade in Thailand, 25% to the ASEAN. And among that, uh -huh, I think almost, like, almost 20%, almost 15% like go around uh -huh, the CLMB country. So it means that uh -huh, we are trading amongst uh, neighboring country and within the ASEAN. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that uh -huh, the company, the listed company has uh, a lot of business uh, from the offshore. That's why if you see our the performance in terms of net profit, the first quarter is uh, increased by 26% uh, year on year. This is because of, uh, it's not depends on the GDP in the Thailand because of uh, those companies that listed on the exchange has uh, diversified. You can see from the first session, Central Group or the Thai Union, they have been uh, doing kind of a global business. I see. So it's uh, quite a natural thing that uh, they, t they use the Thai bars as a transaction uh, money. And uh, you said there's a bond insurance, insurance uh, by the foreign com companies in, in Thai bars, denominated in the Thai bars. And we, we call the, the, the bonds issued in, on, uh, on the Japanese yen is samurai bond, right? So how, how would you call the <laughs> bots bond? We did talk before that uh, he, he recommended uh, to, uh, to, to say that Tom Yam, uh, Tom Yam Kung uh, uh, bonds, uh, but uh, okay. I think uh, I like to call it a Pad Thai. It's a bit better. <laughs> Sweeter, isn't it? Tom Yam is uh, spicy, but uh, Pad Thai is sweet. I think I prefer uh, Pad Thai. Okay, let's call it the Pad Thai bond from now on, okay? <laughs> but I think I just would like to add, yeah. you know, to what Kun Kisra just mentioned. We actually, actually uh, setting up the, uh, our own operation, you know, in the uh, neighboring countries provide us, you know, some more business benefit, not just only for those Thai corporates, you know, who expand the business across the border, but also we can identify, identify business opportunities, you know, for those uh, domestic players as well. For example, you know, the recently the uh, electric city or power generation company, you know, we brought them to Thailand mm. and we helped them raise funds, be it Thai baht or US dollar. Mm. And then some of them who actually um, um, in the uh, good shape in terms of the governance, you know, we can even help them raise funds, you know, through the capital market, I mean, through the bond market. Right? In addition to just serving only Thai corporate going beyond the borders, we can identify business opportunities and, you know, and help those uh, strong players in the domestic market, you know, back to Thailand to raise funds in Thailand, you know, through syndication loan in US dollar denominated loan or Thai baht bond. Yeah, this is another business opportunities. I understand, Mr. Diponcio, that you were here in Bangkok when uh, the, the Asian financial crisis had happened in 19. 
1997. And uh, compared with the, the, the period of time you were here and now, how do you see the difference of the Thai bots and Thai economy and, and the resilience of this region? Yeah, I, I was here until a week before the crisis actually happened. <laughs> you escaped. <laughs> I escaped. Okay. <laughs> But, but I think comparing Thailand then and Thailand today, it, it's very, very different, right? Okay. Uh, even in terms of the, I, I'm no expert in Thailand, but even in terms of the capital markets, uh, I think back then, just like it was in the Philippines, uh, there was very limited sort of access to long-term uh, domestic currency funding. So a lot of the corporates then had to borrow dollar debt, right? And that was one of the major, I think, uh, sort of catalysts for the sort of crisis that happened at that time was all of these foreign currency debt, right? But nowadays, again, comparing then even the Philippines today and then, um, there's a lot more liquidity. The capital markets are a lot more developed. Uh, I think the domestic savings rates in most ASEAN countries have gone up significantly. So there's a lot more alternatives now uh, in terms of the local currency. So I think the environment then and today, it's very different, right? Um, and that's why I agree that the potential for another similar crisis happening is relatively low. I mean, we can't say it's not gonna happen again, but the risk of that happening is probably a lot lower now. And even if it does happen, I don't believe it's going to be the same magnitude as it was back then, right? Again, it's because right now there's a lot more sort of investment alternatives. There's a lot more local currency liquidity. The consumers are wealthier now. The savings rate is higher. So, and more importantly, I do believe that Corporates, especially people in my age, have learned a lot of what during that crisis. And I don't believe it's something which at least my generation would forget, right? Because it was really very difficult, not just for Thailand, but really for almost all countries in the region because of the sort of the domino effect at that time, right? the contagion effect. Um, but again, with markets being more developed now, I am optimistic that chances of that happening is going to be a lot slimmer today. That is an encouraging comment. I was in Washington, D.C. when it happened and look in the, the, the market from distance. And uh, what is said in the market at the time was uh, only one individual investor named uh, George Solos has initiated to pull the trigger. And he ha happened to have found that uh, vulnerability of the Thai board system and just take advantage of it. But I don't know what the reality might be. But uh, this doesn't happen anymore. But still, I believe it has something to do with the volume of the foreign reserve. So it comes to the point where we should discuss about the, the public policy or the monetary policy uh, in terms of the keeping the appropriate amount of the foreign reserve in uh, uh, emerging market economies such as uh, Thailand. So what do you think of the current uh, system, Ms. Kesela? Does uh, Thailand have enough uh, foreign reserve? We believe that uh, the reserve is over 200 uh, million uh, US dollars, which is uh, very high compared to our total debt. It's about three times of our total debt, which is, uh, I think, it's more than enough. Uh -huh. Because of, uh, you can see that uh, the central banks already encourage people to spend more money outside Thailand. Mm. They uh, kind of uh, encourage people to invest offshore. Because of, uh, before that, uh, everything had to be approved, pre-approved before going offshore. But right now, even now, the kind of individual person can, uh, uh, can remit the money at least five million US dollar very easily. We, I believe that we have enough, and uh, you can see that uh, the reflection of uh, we have the current account that are uh, positive. We have the very high foreign reserve, and uh, also that uh, the uh, 
balance of payment, I think it still be everything is in a good shape, even the out of trade balance. That's why uh, you can see that uh, the uh, the Thai baht mm -hmm. has been very stable, mm -hmm. and somehow Thai people uh, complain that it's too strong. Right. <laughs> but I don't know, is it? Uh -huh. But uh, but I think in term of uh, the financial position, both the government size and also that on the budget side, I think the deficit is, has been kept at about 40 plus percent of the GDP, which is we have the limit of 60 percent. So from the government uh, uh, financial status, from the central banks, everything I think is in a good shape. And if you uh, see from the corporate size for the listed company. You can see that uh, the debt to equity for the first quarter of this year is 1.2 times, mm -hmm. which is very low. Uh, and I believe that uh, a, a lot of listed company has a lot of cash. And that's why they invest offshore. They try to buy things, uh -huh, merger and acquisition, and they acquire a lot of companies uh, outside Thailand because they still have a lot of cash. And I believe that because of, uh, they already experienced in 1997, mm -hmm. they are very prudent in managing them. So experience uh, tells uh, what you should do next. Uh, that sounds familiar to me. I have I've seen many uh, Japanese companies who is uh, cash rich, <laughs> but they don't even know what, how to use it. This time, um, I think they know because they spend the money uh -huh, and uh, expand to the offshore business. But uh, they are very considerate in terms of expansion. Good comment. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the next opportunity of the market. We are seeing the, the raising the middle class, middle income class population in this region. Uh, Thailand is uh, the population is declining as Japan is. But uh, looking at the region, uh, middle class is expanding so rapidly. It's quite robust, and which is uh, the driving force of the uh, economic growth. So the question is how to catch them uh, in terms of the banking industry, uh, in terms of the investment to the market. So, uh, so then uh, we have to talk about the technological aspect, how to reach individuals. As Mr. Pipit said uh, earlier, that uh, individual, we have to look at the individuals, persons, not just a, a, a custom, the group of the people. Each person can reach the market and participate in the market. So the question is how the bank can uh, tackle this, this dramatic change of the behavior of the person. A fintech might be the one answer. Can I just, you know, the, uh, frame the thinking, my thinking, my own thinking, you know, when we have to interpret, you know, the um, new strategic imperative for the upcoming business opportunities, you know, I also mentioned earlier about the uh, foreign direct investment into this region, right? This is one of the uh, biggest opportunities, you know, for the real sectors and then for the bank. And the second thing is the uh, international trade, right? Because we've been part of the uh, world order, <laughs> Right, for so many years, right? So now the business opportunities arises very clearly in Asia. So, and we are in Asia as long as we understand the customers, as long as, you know, we set our own footprint to make sure that, you know, we can have access to those market, right? This is another opportunity. And the third thing I just also would like to draw attention to the audience here is the, um, um, retail individual market or the uh, retail customer market basically or the consumer market um, the new generation you know who has more uh, consumption power turn to be um, digital savvy and this is another opportunity right that we can apply the low cost to technology or innovation to provide to come up with a new business model to serve them or to reach them to provide them with a better service Right. Long before cannot be done because of the conventional banking business model. We have to set up brick and mortar, which is far too costly to bear, given the fact that you know, all the banking uh, uh, institutions need to uh, be monitored very uh, carefully or closely by the international investors in the capital market. Right? Because we, we are a part of the international uh, capital market so we have to comply with the uh, international standard 
to the return on investment is expected by an investor should be comparable to the other market, banking sectors in the other market. But now, because of the uh, availabilities of the technology innovation, that can actually help bank come up with a new business model, with basically low-cost business model for the new generation consumer. This is another business opportunity. You have seen a lot of the uh, big tech company or e-commerce company from China is a very good example. They, after they have been very successful in the Chinese domestic market, now they start penetrating into this region. Payment is another uh, business opportunity. And the fact that the um, Chinese middle income class keep growing and the size is tremendous. Now they spend their holidays in Southeast Asian countries. You know, they, they, they land here without any cash. This is the, uh, something they get used to when they are in China. But now when they go out of their own country, they expect something they experience in their own country. Right? So we ask bank, why don't we team up with those Chinese payment company, right, and facilitate those retail small ticket payment, right, as if they are one of our customer. Because in Thailand, I think all banks pursue the so-called customer-centric strategy. You know, we categorize our customer, this is large corporate customer, this is small and medium, medium enterprises, and the retail segment. Now, basically, at Gasikon Bank, we add up another important market segment for the retail client, i.e., the people in transit. It can be expat, it can be migrant workers, it can be tourists. And this provides us a lot and a huge business opportunities because of the regional integration. Mr. Dipuncio, the Filipino people are famous for the, the, as workers in foreign. The remittance is a huge part of the, the GDP. So the Philippines must be the one who is used to that uh, the foreign uh, transaction. Yeah, we actually, want. I wanted to add to that and also yeah. address your question, right? Because um, in the Philippines, there's a still a very big population that's both unbanked and underbanked. Okay. And Means they don't have a bank account. They don't have a bank account. They don't have access to the bank. They're, they're, they're not comfortable going to a brick and mortar bank uh, and make transactions. Um, so there's that huge population which is, I believe, an opportunity for banks to go after. And like I said earlier, it's not going to be brick and mortar. It's going to be more, I would think, uh, a fintech type approach, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look again at the Philippine environment, and I do believe it's probably applicable to other ASEAN countries too, the credit card penetration rate is very low, right? Unlike in the, US, unlike in the developed countries, the US in Japan or in Europe, where credit card is very high, when people buy anything online, it's usually paid by credit card, right? We all know that e-commerce is coming. Uh, in fact, in the Philippines, although it's starting at a very low base, it's growing very, very fast. But the biggest chunk of the e-commerce transactions are still cash. So it's basically cash on delivery. So you have all of this, you know, courier service to provide the last mile service. They bring a package to you, which you ordered, but you pay them cash. So there's a lot of risks as well involved in all these courier companies carrying cash back to wherever they need to make the deposit, right? So I think that's also one reason why e-commerce probably has not totally taken off yet is because of the payment system, right? And I may be wrong, but I think that it's going to leapfrog the credit card and go direct to like digital payments, digital wallets, right? Uh, I do believe that that's where this industry is headed. Um, and in fact, talking about the overseas remittances, right? A lot of those are done now via cards. You know? 
Um, usually, it's via prepaid cards in the phone where you can transfer payments and all that stuff. So I think that's the very basic, and then you go higher and become more sophisticated, right? In fact, I think there's probably more Filipinos who own smartphones than have bank accounts. Mm. So if we start doing the same things that, let's say, the Chinese companies are doing, that's the next opportunity, which I think will, will leapfrog credit card penetration. That, that's my personal view. Right? That makes me worry about Japan. When I, as long as I stay in Tokyo, the only thing that I have to do is to open my wallet and found, I find uh, more than five credit cards. If one card cannot, I cannot use it in the shop because it reached the limit, I use the second one. So I never worry about the money. You know, it's, it is there. And the credit card is, is free, basically. So you have a lot of cards in the wallet. Thick wallet. I have to carry them on. Well, I went to Shenzhen in China a couple weeks ago, and I found nobody use currency. I mean, real money. They use a smartphone. They don't even open the wallet. The taxi, even uh, the street musician. Uh, they just use the uh, WeChat Pay. And uh, the membership of the, the number of members of the WeChat is one billion. So this is a big platform. So, and uh, you were saying that they are imbuing, from going beyond the border into the Asian market. The Chinese people come as a tourist. So, and uh, the people in Asia, Southeast Asia get used to watching the, how they behave in the conception behavior. So why not doing it the same? So I guess the having a legacy of credit card or banking systems can be disadvantageous in the digital age, isn't it? Is, is this something happening in, in Southeast Asia, like China, Shenzhen, Thailand? What do you think, Mr. Thailand already started, uh -huh. some, uh, some store already accept the uh, WeChat, uh, WePay. Uh -huh. They already accept because of, uh, they already have the Chinese clients. And uh, once uh, they know and uh, the kind of, uh, the bank has been uh, kind of uh, start operating this kind of things, uh, I believe that uh -huh. It's going to be more popular and more popular for the younger people. And I think as, as tourism continues to grow rapidly across the region, right? And, you know, the biggest growth, at least for the Philippines, are the Chinese tourists. So they being so used to doing everything with their smartphones, you know, it, it, it will follow. And they, they look so cool. They don't open the wallet just to... So people want to imitate, you know, they want to do the same as they behave. I think it's more convenient and also that uh, I think it's less cost. Uh, otherwise mm. you have to carry all kind of uh, the credit card and you have to pay at the end of the, the month uh, at five for credit card anyway. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, and uh, FinTech technology, it seems to be it, it's based on the, the platform of communication such as uh, WeChat. Uh, in Thailand, I heard Line is popular, right? And, and in Philippines, in Singapore, they use WeChat. I know uh, WhatsApp. And in in Philippines, Line saying WhatsApp. Okay. Okay, in Thailand, I think uh, that that uh, very popular for the lines. And in China, it's uh, WeChat. So it seems like they they're competing in, in such a platforms. So who is winning, WeChat or Line? What do you think? Is there any company from Southeast Asia? I, I don't know, you know, about, about other markets, you know, but as long as I understand, you know, Lie, and Lie is very popular, right? Dominate Thai market and Laos market, right? Because we speak the basically... Thai, Laos, Japan? Yeah, Japan, Japan also. I don't know. Lie, Lie is, is Japan. Lie is, yeah, is the most right? popular okay. one in Japan. And the, um, the others, WeChat and WhatsApp, Right, but the uh, when it is come to the um, who is going to win in this game, you know, on mobile platform of mm. the payment system, that is quite difficult because, you know, once each industry um, has unique strength, right, and some of them start collaborating, that is something is the winning is going to be promising. Then you know doing by your own, right? So the reason I say this, you know, because everything related to payment has to go through the central bank approval, right, for the uh, stability of the uh, 
uh, economy of the country, right? But the banking sector, you know, the unique strength is that, you know, the KYC, you know, the accuracy of information, you know, the reliability, you know, the trustworthy of organization, this is the strength of the bank. We process, you know, huge amount of transaction, you know, in a minute, right? But we are way slow, right? We respond very slowly to the ever-changing uh, needs of the consumer, particularly for the young digital savvy segment. But if we team up, you know, with tech firm or those, you know, fintech-like organization, we can come up very quickly any innovation, right? This is a new ways of looking and and the uh, exploring business opportunities in this region, given given the fact that the uh, uh, rising of the middle class, and then everything can be done across the border at ease. Ms. Kesela, what do you think is the appropriate uh, regulatory framework when it comes to the fintech? I mean, you have to be prudent because uh, information flow, data flow, is, if it's totally free, so somebody might be taking advantage of the, the data accumulation. And uh, what is the, the status of Thai now? And, uh, I think in, in the Thai context, uh -huh, the, uh, both the Central Bank, the Bank of Thailand, and the regulator from the Security Exchange Commission has been very open mind in terms of uh, to support the fintech industry. They already opened the sandbox uh -huh, for the fintechs uh -huh, to see that how it's going. And they have been running the competition amongst the fintechs. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, but uh, on the regulation side, I think they are watching and they are trying to see that how could they draft the regulation. But in terms of the principle, what we are seeing that uh -huh, they like to open uh, up the, the industry, which I, uh, which I wish uh, that uh, they are going to open for the existing, uh, existing financial institution and the exchange too. <laughs> in terms of uh, because of, uh, right now fintech has been like high up uh, in a sandbox. Uh -huh. But uh, what we are seeing that uh, in terms of the existing financial institution, uh, we have a lot of regulation too. But in terms of uh, the existing financial. Rec uh, institution like K Bank or some other banks, they already set up uh, the subsidiary and exploring all kinds of fintechs. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, we already have uh, a kind of uh, a unit that uh, exploring this kind of things uh, because of, uh, we are seeing the opportunity that if we offer these, uh, the new features of the fintech attached to our existing uh, service, it would give a uh, high the customer is like kind of more convenience. I see. Uh, individual uh, investors and the consumer is something to do with the stock index too, because in Thailand, I understand institutional investor is only 30% or 40%. The majority is uh, in a private investor, right? I think uh, right now it's about half and half. Half uh -huh. and a half? Half is retail, so individual retail. Another half is institution, which is 25 to 30% from foreign. The rest is uh, the local institutions. Mm. So that is uh, the, one of the reasons why the liquidity is high? Uh, it's possibly because of, uh, normally retail, like kind of individual investor would uh, think different from the institutional investor. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, Thailand, I, I have to say that this is kind of, uh, it's just uh, our history that uh, the individual investor and the institutional investor has been uh, happen in the same time. So they are, even they are retail investors, they are quite mature. They already have a lot of information that flow around. And as we have the FinTech, and we have all the kind of information vendor, everywhere we can find the information, even from the line, <laughs> every day. Uh -huh. Which is, uh, and uh, in terms of accessibility to the market, uh, the, the individual cost is not so high. Uh, compared, uh, I think uh, it's comparable to the institutional investor. Mm -hmm. That's why I think in terms of uh, uh, to access to the Thai market, uh, it would be up to them to decide that, uh, which, uh, uh, which channel that they like to go in. Now we are going into the stage where we discuss uh, risk. 
of financial market. I think uh, the portion of the individual investor and the institutional investor is something uh, you have to discuss. I think the half and half might be the the positive sign of the resilience in, in the Thai uh, market. What I see that uh, in terms of the Thai market, uh, what we are seeing that uh, in, uh, so far, uh, my belief that uh, the stock market has been uh, in a maturity, in a more mature in terms of uh, compared to the past 10 years. And we are seeing it uh, a lot of uh, events that you see that uh, all kind of uncertainty from the political uh, incident in Thailand. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that the stock market has been respond in a kind of uh, a more mature market and uh, both the institutional investor and the individual. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, we, we think that the uh, Thai market is a kind of resilient market. Mm -hmm. This is, is applied to the bond market too. Mm -hmm. For SM Group, uh, are you interested in merging a fintech company? You have a bank within a family, and uh, you are interested in, in a fintech as well. Well, you know that one of the core business of the SM Group is the banking side, right? Yeah. So fintech is definitely something which we cannot disregard because it will come. It's just a question of when, right? And it's going to be, I think, a disruptor to us in a sense to the banking sector because then the consumers can just do things online and not have to go do some of the services the banks would normally do. So it is something which we are very conscious of and are aggressively exploring opportunities in the fintech space. Um, but I think like was mentioned previously, it's something which I don't think we want to start from scratch. Uh, it's something which maybe we want to partner or JV with somebody who's already in that business so we can jumpstart the, the process, right? But, you know, together with FinTech and the digital age, I think there's also going to be some additional or new risks that we need to be conscious of particularly in terms of, let's say, hacking and, and whatnot, right? Um, because then it becomes more critical in that sense. And I think traditional bankers like me before is no longer going to be as in demand, but rather they'll be more like tech bankers, who is what's going to be needed in the, in the industry these days. What does Cashcom Bank do with uh, fintech or mobile banking? Uh, what is your strategy? Can you reveal a little bit of your scenario? I think as I mentioned earlier, you know, we uh, redefine our strategy. You know, we redefine our customer segmentation. Right? We see the business opportunities you know, beyond Thailand. And also we embrace uh, all those changing business environment, you know, having uh, superpowers like Japan, Korea, and China coming into place into this region. Right? And this is the context based upon which, you know, we redraft our strategy. And uh, in addition to that, you know, touch a little bit upon the uh, uh, fintech strategy. You know, we believe in collaboration. We don't think that we can create everything by ourselves because we are not someone, you know, who are really creative, who are really innovative, you know, because banks are trained to be really rich the worst. <laughs> this, this is true. The bankers, all the bankers are rich the worst, you know, maybe you know, apart from besides the uh, M&A investment banker. <laughs> so the um, oh, digital transformation strategy has been discussed widely in the boardroom. This is, you know, to let you see how serious it is in the banking sector in Thailand. And it has become one of the strategic agendas of the bank. In addition to uh, previous years ago, we add up the uh, regional strategy you know, into the bank strategy. And then recently, uh, two years ago, we start to add another big strategic piece, i.e. digital transformation, right? But I would like to say, to change management philosophy, right, to be ready to really embrace the changing uh, in the digital space is not easy for the bank. So what I'm going to say is the, um, the major hindrance to this transformation lies inside the bank itself rather than, you know, external environment. 
you know the young people the young staff you know they would like to uh, team up with those fintech big or small around the globe right they can bring up a lot of innovative idea to do business even better right but we have to go through the internal uh, compliance and then again to the regulators right and i would like to say no one is wrong no one is right it's a kind of transition period you know for the whole system not just only fintech not just only the uh, junior employees at the bank or even central banker so meaning that we have to learn together right to make sure that innovation will not be harmful to the uh, consumer right so this kind of thing we have to uh, believe or work together you know in the belief that we will do things even better right but we are not going to uh, put the banking industry or the banking platform the conventional banking platform you know into the uh, very uh, risky uh, uh, operation or something like that so it is now you know very difficult for the uh, management of the bank and the even central banker right because they we have to try dedicated balance you know between innovation and again you know the consumer protection uh, this is a major challenge and one important challenge for us is how shall we build a new breed of talent who really understand the tech and understand the banking so it is not easy so the, but we have to go through this challenge together i mean for the whole banking system in thailand and uh, maybe you know across the region as well i think singapore and china are very good to example you know of the private and public sector that work together you know to embrace this kind of digital innovation right i see some uh, dilemma in between between uh, democracy and uh, uh, technological innovation but final point i want to discuss before we end up is uh, corporate governance which i'm sure is some, has something to do with the resilience and the risk and i'm particularly glad to have the mr deponshu here because he is the first person to be here a uh, president of sm group who came from the outside of the family founding family am i correct so what does this tell to us because uh, when the uh, financial crisis happened 20 years ago one of the reason why it developed so rapidly is the bank within a family business means uh, financing you know uh, each other within a family makes things even worse because it's not transparent but now you still have a bank in your com company your group but you as a outsider sort of so what does this tell well i think corporate governance is something which we take very seriously uh it's something which we want to do and it's something which we know our investors expect from us as well okay uh sm investments is a listed entity and it has subsidiaries like sm prime bdo china bank that are also listed entities uh in fact the two largest market capitalization listed company in the philippine stock exchange today are both sm group companies right smic and sm prime and a lot of foreign investors uh would view us as being a proxy to the philippine economy given the breadth of our businesses and so we do have a lot of foreign investors in our sort of shareholder list and from them we also want to make sure that corporate governance is very important uh we believe that it's something which we need to be able to continue to grow in fact as we acquire new businesses or jv with other companies uh one thing which we focus on immediately is corporate governance uh we believe that to be able to sustain our growth through generations and retain the reputation uh of being a prudent business group it's very important to have corporate governance particularly related party transactions uh, which is what you were referring to earlier right um it's something which not just us internally but even the regulators in the philippines are focused on right 
whether it be the Security Exchange Commission, the Central Bank, the Stock Exchange, there is an increased focus, I think, globally uh, in corporate governance. And as one of the biggest groups in the Philippines, it's something which we want to be sort of the pioneer, the leader in, in terms of really focusing on making sure that we have all of those in place. Because without those, I don't think we'll be able to grow the way we've been growing. And the fact that, like you mentioned, uh, I'm very honored that I'm the first non-family to be president of this group. Uh, it does show that the majority owner, the shareholding family, is very much focused on professionalizing the organization. And together with professionalizing is obviously corporate governance. Mm -hmm. what, what were you told exactly from the TC fam I mean, uh, C family when you were appointed as a president? Did they just simply say you as a one? Or I just want to, I'm just curious what happened behind, us, behind the scene. Well, <clears throat> it, it's really a constant uh, or a conscious effort by the family that they want to professionalize, right? Uh, we've actually been, other than myself, we've actually been inviting people from outside, particularly those who work with multinationals, to come join the group. Uh, and with those sort of new ideas also come better corporate governance practices uh, and risk management practices. So, you know, when, as the con group continues to grow, and as now we start expanding into sort of more and more equity investments in non-core businesses, um, the family felt that it was time to sort of transfer the reign to professional management to really bring the group to a new level in terms of new businesses uh, that we're going into. I see. Ms. Kesela, I understand that uh, about 85% of all companies in, in Asia and the Pacific region are family owned. Mm. And uh, which can be the advantage in terms of the, the speed of decision making, but at the same time it can be a disadvantage of being a transparent, transparent to the market. Uh, what, yes. what do you think of it? In Thailand, uh -huh, what I already said that uh -huh, they have uh, a lot of IPOs and we still believe that uh -huh, in the next few years we still have uh, the demand for the IPO. Those are the family business. We have to accept that in, the, uh, in Asia that you already said 85% is a uh, family owned business. But uh, the family owned business right now is uh, come to the second and third generation. Those like to be more professional. That's why they like to be listed on the exchange. And some of them don't want to manage their own business. They like to hire the professionals uh, to, to manage their business. That's why we still have uh, a lot of demands uh, for the new listing. But in terms of Thailand, uh, as we already uh, have uh, had a crisis in the year 1997, uh, it's, uh, it's an opportunity that we start to do the corporate governance. In terms of the exchange, we require the listing, the listing requirement. We need an independent director, at least three people. And since then, I believe that in terms of the Thai market, on the corporate governance scorecard compared to the ASEAN market, the top 100 company we compare for the uh, whole ASEAN, we are running at the top uh, ranking of, uh, among uh, the ASEAN companies. And uh, we believe that uh, also that uh, right now we are moving not only the corporate governance, we move into the sustainability, which include the uh, social responsibilities and the environment. And this is measured by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. We have like 14 companies, including the Gasicon Bank last year, uh, that are counting into the DJSI. And uh, this number, 14 companies, is the highest among the ASEAN exchange too. Very encouraging. Thank you very much. And uh, time is up, and I have to wrap up here. And thank you very much again. For, please give the big hands again for three panelists, Ms. Kesela and Mr. Pipit and Mr. Dipunshio. Thank you very much for very educational and insightful comments. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for another very insightful discussion. Now we would like to move on to session three.